All right, boys, you made it. It's the final unit, uh, series and sequences. As you can tell, there's quite a, quite a bit to get through today. So, uh, what is a series? Let's, let's start with that, shall we? So, this, is, this uh, unit is specifically targeted infinite series, okay? An infinite series is also known as an infinite sum. And we use the uh, sign sigma to denote that, okay? An infinite series, in it being infinite, is it is a summation from some finite number to infinity, okay? An infinite sum adds up an infinite amount of numbers. Now, the obvious answer to this is if I add up an infinite number of ones, I'm going to get infinity, right? And that would make sense. However, what the, this unit is largely directed at is determining whether series diverge to infinity. Diverge means they go to either positive or negative infinity, or whether a series converges. Converges means it, has, it converges to some finite number. Let's call that C. Okay? This series, you would say, is divergent. It goes up and up to infinity, okay? If I gave you a different infinite series, let's say the infinite sum from n equals zero to infinity of one over n squared, okay? That converges to a finite number c. Now, what it actually converges to, the actual value it converges to, is something slightly beyond the scope of this unit. Right now, the main focus is determining whether it diverges or converges. And you'll see that's going to be difficult enough as we go on. There will be some series that we'll be able to find an actual value to which they converge to. So why don't we take a look at one type of series that we're going to be able to find the number that it converges to. That's called the geometric series. Geometric series, okay? Now a geometric series is the infinite sum from n equals zero or you could say n equals 1, n equals some finite number to infinity. Now, a geometric series has the general form some constant number to the n. Okay? Now, they might try to trick you. They might try and rewrite this as 1 over 2 to the n. But keep in mind, 1 to the n is always 1. So if they decide to write it in this form, you can convert that to 1 to the n over 2 to the n, which is the same as 1 over 2 all to the n. Okay, so make sure you know how to identify it when you see it. It is just an infinite addition, an infinite sum of numbers that differ by a constant multiple. So let's try and write this out, okay? At n equals 1, n equals 1, our first term is 1 half, okay? And then we add that to the second term, n equals 2. At n equals 2, we add 1 fourth. At n equals 3, we add 1 eighth. At n equals 4, we add 1 sixteenth. And this goes on and on and on and on to infinity, okay? So each step in the process is the original, or the one before it, I should say, multiplied by 1 half. So we could say that 1 half is the constant rate, the constant multiple, between each of our terms in our series, okay? So let's call that number r, and we say our rate is one half. And you can see that the rate is always equal to whatever's inside the parentheses with n. An infinite series from n equals some constant c to infinity of a sub n it's just some notation to represent a series of some kind, that is a geometric series, converges to a over 1 minus r, okay? Where a is the first term in the series.
a is the first term in the series, okay? We already discussed what r is. r is your constant rate. Therefore, you could say that a geometric series converges to the first term divided by 1 minus the rate. Okay, so if we try and solve this out, our first term here is 1 half, 1 over 2, divided by 1 minus the rate. And our rate here is 1 half. So this is 1 half divided by 1 half equals 1. Okay? Our geometric series here, the infinite sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 half to the n converges to 1. Okay, and it makes sense. We start at 0.5, then we go to 0.75, then we go to 0.825, and so on and so forth. And you can see as you expand out more and more numbers, you get closer and closer to 1, but your numbers increase. Uh, less and less rapidly, okay? This is a throwback to um, our initial limits unit when we use table of values to approximate what a limit converged to. That's effectively what you can employ here to try and get an idea of what this might converge to, and then you'd use the formula to figure out exactly what it converges to. This formula is only useful if the series actually converges. Right? So if I replaced this with 2 to the n, then, because n keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, this whole term will keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and let's play that out. So we would start at 2, then we would go to 4, then we would go to 8, and so on and so forth. So that type of infinite sum would be divergent. The sum would go to positive infinity. So if you tried to use this formula, you would get an answer. You would get a finite number, but the series is divergent, therefore the formula doesn't apply. So be careful to make sure that the series actually does indeed converge before you use this formula. Because if you just plug into this formula straight away, it won't be obvious the series is divergent. So to help you with that, we've got a series of tests and other arithmetic uh, steps you can take to decide whether a series is convergent or divergent. The first test is the uh, nth term test for divergence. Sadly, I must tell you guys that you need to memorize the names of all these tests. I know, for the entirety of Calc BC, I said this is the quotient rule, this is product rule, this is u substitution, and you didn't need to memorize any of the names, right? You didn't need to memorize any of those names. You do need to memorize the names for all of the um, divergence and convergence tests, because you will need to cite them by name if you're writing an FRQ response, okay? So in the uh, FRQ, there's always an FRQ that's entirely dedicated to series on the BC exam. On the FRQ, if it asks you, if it gives you a series and it asks you, is this convergent and diver or divergent and why, you would do the math, you would do the test, and then you would write by hand in your answer by the nth term test for divergence, this series is divergent. Okay. So you need to memorize these names, and you know how to. You need to know how to cite them in your FRQ responses. Anywho, let's move on. The nth term test for divergence. So, in the nth term test for divergence, where we take a series, okay, and we take our a sub n component. We take a sub n, which is just some notation that we use to represent anything that goes inside the infinite sum, okay? So in this case, our 2 to the n would be our a sub n. You could have our 1 half to the n would have been our a sub n. So any a sub n, any part of the series inside the sigma, we, what we would do is we would take the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, okay? This is an infinite sum. This is us adding up all of the numbers from c to infinity. This is just what is the last number. 
what is the value, what is the last number in our series of additions that we add, okay? In order for the series to be convergent, in order for the series to converge to a finite number, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n has to be zero. It has to be zero, okay? Meaning, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n does not equal zero, then we know for a fact it is divergent. If, however, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n does equal zero, the test is indeterminate. Okay, and I'll explain why in, uh, in later. So in our example here, if I took the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 to the n, that goes to infinity, obviously. But if I took the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2 to the n, that approaches 0, okay? So this up here, since it converges to a non-zero value, we know for a fact is divergent. But this one on the bottom, since it does have the limit approach infinity as n approaches infinity, since that does equal zero, the test is inconclusive. And again, I'll get into that later. Our second test is what we call the integral test. Oh, integrals, welcome back. The integral test. The integral test states that if you're given an infinite sum from n equals 0 to infinity, again, I write n equals 0, but it doesn't have to say n equals 0. Often on the BC exam, they will use both n equals 0 and n equals 1, or n equals, rarely, they use 2 or some other number. Just know that n could equal any constant c, and the same rules for the sum of for the sigmas still apply, okay? So the summation of a sub n converges if the integral from 1 to infinity of a sub n converges, okay? This is a reference back to our uh, integral unit when we covered improper integrals that had infinity as one of the bounds. I told you in that video that this topic is not useful for your integral test, however it is essential for the series unit. So if you uh, watched my integral video and decided to skip that part, I suggest you go back and watch it now because if you don't know what improper integrals are, you're not going to be able to do this. All right? So I'm hoping you've watched it now, and I'm going to continue. And uh, with this statement, the contrapositive is also true. The summation converges if the integral converges, and the summation diverges if the integral diverges. And let's take the area under the curve from, that's an 8, from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n dn, or 1 over 2 to the x dx, whatever you want to write, okay? So if we remember our antiderivative rules, this equals uh, 1 over 2 to the n over the natural log of one half evaluated one to infinity. Okay? Evaluated our upper bound, one over half to the infinity. One over two to the infinity is one half times one half times one half times one half, an infinite number of times. So that converges to zero. And from that we subtract this whole thing evaluated at one. One half to the 1 is 1 half divided by ln 1 half, okay? Finite number. That is a finite number right there. 
Therefore, our integral converges. And if our integral converges, that means our infinite sum converges. However, it is important to note the integral and the infinite sum do not converge to the same value. As I have shown you before, 1 is not the same as 1 half over ln of 1 half. And if this looks a bit wonky to you, like how could this be a negative and had this be a positive, just remember ln of 1 half is a negative number. So this would uh, even out to a positive number when you do the computation. Anywho, that's the integral test. Next is the harmonic and the p-series. Okay. The harmonic series is a special type of p-series. A p-series is oh, an infinite series or an infinite sum, n equals 1 to infinity, of 1 over n to some number p, where p is a constant and n is, you know, your counter, of course. I like to call this n term the counter variable because it increments by one every iteration of the uh, summation. So this is a p-series, okay? This could take the form of, let's say, this area inside the summation is a sub n. a sub n could be 1 over n squared, it could be 1 over n to the 1 half, it could be 1 over n to the 200, whatever. It is in the form 1 over n, where n is raised to some number p. Okay, that's different from this, because it's some number being raised to n. This is the other way around. And the rule is, if p is greater than 1, the series converges. Else the series diverges. Okay, so let's give you an example. Let's say we choose p equals 2. 2 is greater than 1. If I take the infinite sum of 1 over n squared, you know, we'd start with 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 plus 1 over 16. And you see the constant sequential terms of this series are decreasing in value very fast, okay? It would just be a lot easier for you if you just memorize this rule, okay? This isn't a cheat code, this isn't uh, some trick, this is the proof that you are expected to give on the BC exam. If they give you a series that's 1 over n to the 1 half, you are expected to say the series diverges because this is a p-series and p is less than 1. That is the explanation you're expected to give. So you don't need to write it out, you don't need to visualize it, none of this, just memorize this rule. Okay? But that being said, we get to the fun part of this rule. What if p equals 1? Okay. Well, we've already looked at the rule, we've already said that if p equals 1, 1 is not greater than 1, so the series diverges, but why? Let's take a look at that. Uh, let's take a look at the infinite sum, infinity to n equals 1, of 1 over n to the 1, or 1 over n. If we look at the graph of 1, uh, 1 over x, 1 over n, let's assume the x-axis is n, looks like that, okay? To me, it looks like the numbers are getting lower and lower, and they're decreasing pretty fast, okay? But if we try to use the nth term test for divergence, we take the limit as n goes to infinity, okay? Let's say the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n, that equals 0, but that's indeterminate. That doesn't prove that it converges. So what do we do now? Well, we can try the integral test. Let's try 
the area under the curve from 1 to infinity of 1 over n dn, or 1 over x dx. And you see that that's the same as natural log of n evaluated 1 to infinity. Okay? The natural log of infinity goes to infinity. minus natural log of 0 is 1. So we have a divergent integral. If the integral diverges, the summation diverges. If the integral converges, the summation converges. We did the integral test, and we proved that the integral diverges. Therefore, this diverges. This, the infinite sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n, is the harmonic series. Moving on from there, let's start with our next uh, test, which is a more general test. You'll find you'll be using this test a lot more often, if not on the BC exam, just in your head to check your answers. It's called the uh, comparison test. So the comparison test states that if I have some series, let's say summation of uh, 2 over n. I haven't seen this before, okay? Let's say you've never seen this before. You could do the integral test, you could do the limit comparison test, but another test that we like to use is we like to compare it to another summation or another series that looks similar, okay? So the objective of the comparison test is to say, if I wanted to find out if this is divergent, okay, if I wanted to find out if it diverges to infinity, I need to find some other series that also diverges to infinity, but stays beneath this one constantly. So, if this line right here represents my uh, other series, the other series that I know can diverges to infinity, and I know that the series I'm given is for all values greater than my other series, I then know that this also diverges to infinity. The same thing also applies to if I were to be given a series that I wanted to prove converges, I could choose another series that I know converges to some value, and then I can prove that the series I'm given is below or less than that series for all values n, then I can say if this series diverge, converges, if this series converges, this one must also converge because this is less than that. Okay, so we can compare this guy to the summation of 1 over n n equals 0 to infinity, okay? We know that this guy diverges. I just proved it for you up there. We know this guy diverges, okay? This guy is the same thing as 2 times 1 over n. And in series, you can factor out the 2. Constant multiple rule still applies to series. And in that case, we now have two series that look pretty much identical. We know this one diverges, and we know that this one also then diverges because it is double the value. We got that extra 2 there, okay? That's effectively the comparison test. If you use this on an FRQ, you would need to, one, identify the series you're comparing it to, uh, identify that the series diverges and do a whole proof as to why it diverges. Uh, you know, P-series test, the integral test, whatever. You'd need to do a test for this one to prove that it diverges. And then you'd need to prove that this is fundamentally larger than that. You know, by way of having this constant multiple of two. Same would apply for convergence. You'd need to identify a series do some tests to prove that the, your chosen series converges, 
and then you would write in your FRQ why the given series is fundamentally less than the one you compared it to. Therefore, it also converges. Now, let me introduce you guys to what is called the alternating series, and you're going to see why it's called that in just a moment. So the alternating series is, as you might imagine, a series that alternates. Specifically, it alternates between positive and negative values. Okay? So an alternating series would be something like the infinite sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n multiplied by your a sub n. Okay? This is your alternating component because negative 1 to the 0 is 1. Negative 1 to the 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 to the 2 is 1. So it constantly alternates between multiplying your a sub n by 1 and multiplying your a sub n by negative 1. Never changing the magnitude of your a sub n, just changing whether it's positive or negative. And since this is an infinite sum, changing whether it is added or subtracted. So that's the alternating component, okay? Now for alternating series, we have a new alternating series test. The alternating series test sort of coincides with your nth term test here, such that if you're given an alternating series and the limit as n, uh, excuse me, limit goes, limit as n approaches infinity of your a sub n, if that equals zero, and the terms in your a sub n are uh, constantly decreasing, if these two conditions are satisfied, then we converge. We said here that if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals zero, if it does equal zero, then the test was indeterminate. But in an alternating series, if it equals zero, we know it's convergent. If you, uh, let's say our a sub n, let's replace a sub n with one over n, okay? One over n is a great example. One over n, the limit as n goes to infinity approaches zero. And we just proved that one over n, when it's not an alternating series, diverges. But one over n, when it is an alternating series, converges. Let me show you exactly why. First of all, as I just showed you over here, or up there, wherever I did it, right here, limit as n goes to infinity of your a sub n does indeed equal zero. And you're constantly decreasing, as you can see by the graph of 1 over n, or 1 over x. Since those two conditions are met, we converge. Okay, our next test is the ratio test. The ratio test goes like this. Let's say I'm given an infinite series from n equals 1 to infinity of, uh, let's say, n to the 4 over n factorial, okay? In a series, you know, when you expand it out like this, the ratio test says you need to select two components, okay, that are adjacent to one another. Or your first component is n to the fourth uh, over n factorial, and your second component would be n plus 1 to the fourth over n plus 1 factorial. Makes sense, right? This is your second term. And then what, uh, what it says to do from there is you divide these two divided by n to the fourth over n factorial. Now divide, take a ratio, and we're going to rewrite that, n plus 1 to the fourth, keep change opposite, times n factorial over n to the fourth, and if you guys uh, remember factorial rules from pre-calc or algebra, whatever, this can be rewritten as n plus 1 to the fourth over n plus 1 
times n factorial times uh, n factorial over n to the fourth, these guys cancel. And then you're left with, let's bring this back down here, n plus 1 all to the fourth over n plus 1 n to the fourth. The top and bottom here can cancel, so we're left with n plus 1 to the third over n to the fourth. And now that we have a very simplified version, last step of the ratio test is to take the limit as n approaches infinity of our ratio, remember this is a ratio, of n plus 1 to the third over n to the fourth. And if we do that, uh, we uh, effectively get infinity to the third over infinity to the fourth. And you see that the denominator here is growing much faster than the numerator. So this limit uh, goes to zero, okay? So the condition for the ratio test is your limit value right here. Let's call this value K. The absolute value of K must be less than one, okay? If K is less than one, your series converges. So our k was 0, absolute value of 0 is less than 1, our series converges. Let me erase my whiteboard real quick. Now guys, if you have a bunch of spare masks left over from COVID, they make great whiteboard erasers. Okay, so I left this part of, um, of the notes up just because it has special pertinence to our next topic. Uh, the difference between absolutely convergent and conditionally convergent. Okay, so as the name implies, a uh, series can be convergent conditionally, which means uh, the condition being that isn't it is an alternating series, or it can be convergent absolutely, meaning that it is convergent with or without being an alternating series. My point is the condition that, that is mentioned is the condition of it being an alternating series. It having that alternating series term, negative one to the n, or negative one to the n plus one, or negative one to the n minus one, all those make it an alternating series. Okay? So this, the infinite sum, uh, is n uh, from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n is a perfect example because in this form right now it's divergent. However, if we take the infinite sum from uh, n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n times negative 1 to the n plus 1, let's say, if we do that, then this becomes a convergent series, as I have just demonstrated in the, uh, well, what test did I use for that? The alternating series test. Using the alternating series test, you can prove this is convergent. Therefore, without your alternating series component, it's divergent. With your alternating series component, it's convergent. Therefore, these, this series can be called conditionally convergent. Meanwhile, you have a series like the infinite series from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared, which is convergent in this form. And if it is convergent in this form, then it has to be convergent if it's an alternating series. So we would call this absolutely convergent. It's not that hard a topic, it's just a little question that mm, tends to maneuver its way on to a lot of the time FRQs and almost always uh, multiple choice. A series is a pretty big part of the BC exam when compared to all the other units because it's the only unit that's sort of standalone 
and sort of independent of derivatives and integrals and all of this. So you guys, you know, obviously you're going to go to Khan Academy, linked in the description, and you're going to take advantage of their amazing free practice problems that I used to get my five, okay? That, it would be stupid of you not to do that. Also, you know, I've got my Discord server linked down there. You will ever need questions. I don't charge. I'm here to help you guys. Why would I be making these videos? But anyway, let's keep moving. What's next? Alternating series error bound. So let's say you're given this, the infinite sum from n equals a 1 to infinity, 1 over n to the negative times negative 1 to the n plus 1. Okay, let's say you're given that series. The alternating series error bound, uh, when, it's, when this topic is given to you in form of a question, by how much could s sub 5, by how much could s sub 5 possibly differ from what this series converges to from the infinite sum n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the negative 1 times negative 1 to the n plus 1. Differ from this series, or what it converges to. Now this notation, s sub 5, just a new notation that I'm going to have to introduce to you guys, s sub n, or in this case s sub 5, is the partial sum of the first n terms, okay? Let me show you what that means with s sub 5 as an example. s sub 5, okay, I just said it's the partial sum of the first n terms, first five terms. So you take the first term, uh, 1 over 1, 1 times negative 1 squared would be 1 minus 1 half, that's the second term, plus 1 third, third term, minus 1 fourth, fourth term, plus 1 fifth, the fifth term. The partial sum of the first five terms is the first five terms added up. Okay? That's why it's called a partial sum, because the rest of the series keeps going. You're just taking a part of it. So if we were to continue this series out, we'd get minus 1 sixth, plus 1 seventh, minus 1 eighth, plus 1 ninth. Okay, so if we look here, if we take negative 1 sixth plus 1 seventh, that together is going to make a negative number. Negative 1 eighth plus 1 ninth, that together, because 1 eighth is greater than 1 ninth, is going to make a negative number. So our partial sum here would be about 0 0.78, if my math is correct, which it may not be. Anyway, as we can see here, if we group negative 1 6 plus 1 7, negative 1 8 plus 1 9th, if we group those terms like this, you see we're constantly subtracting something from this amount. Therefore, our partial sum is an overestimate, therefore it is bounded by this, uh, this partial sum is the upper bound, okay? And the lower bound would be our partial sum minus, in this case minus, if we were constantly adding numbers, it would be plus, but we're not, in this case it's minus, minus one-sixth, which is about 0 0.175 something. So that would play out to something something around uh, 0 0.6. Oh, okay. So alternating series error bound states that our partial sum, 0 0.78, is off, it differs from this series by a maximum of one-sixth. Okay, it's just, it differs by a maximum of the next term in the series. Okay, and if the question wants you to go a bit further, states, what is the, what is the alternating series bounded between? You'd give these two values.
Your upper bound would be, in this case, your partial sum. If we uh, looked at the rest of the series and realized we were constantly adding numbers, then your partial sum would be your lower bound. But either way, our answer is bounded between these two values. Okay, I had to go out and get a haircut real quick, but we're back now. Anyway, next topic. Oh, good, oh, how nice. The Taylor and McLaurin series. Okay. So what exactly is that? Well, the McLaurin series is a special type of the Taylor series, so let's start with that. Um, let's start with what the McLaurin series is. So, the McLaurin series is, I really like teaching it using this analogy. I'm sure we all remember uh, local linear approximation. Now, that was back when we took our original x value plus our change in x, and then we calculated the change in y over the change in x with the tangent line, and then we added that to our original y value, and that gave us a new x-coordinate and a new y-coordinate, okay? Now that is basically using the first derivative, change in y over change in x, or you can rewrite that as f prime of x times the change in x, that use the first derivative to calculate our second point. But we all know that local linear approximation isn't all that accurate. If you go further distances or if you've got a wonky tangent line. So what Taylor and Maclaurin series do is instead of using just the first derivative, they take the first derivative and the second derivative and the third derivative, and all the derivatives down to infinity, such that if you include all the derivatives in your answer, you get an approximation that converges to the exact value of the function. It's basically a local linear approximation that's not an approximation anymore. It's you're reconstructing the function from scratch, effectively. So now let me draw you a graph, okay? Let's say it looks a little something like that. Darken that. Looks a little something like that. Okay. Now, I don't know what this function is. This is just a line on a graph that I've never seen before. Okay. But I know the values of its slopes. I know the values of its derivatives. Okay. So let's say I wanted to approximate this point right here. Okay, and we're going to do an approximation from this point, say x equals zero. Okay, so the way we're going to do that is we're going to continuously approach a more precise approximation. So firstly, let's construct the function, let's say a of x for approximation equals f of zero, okay? If we do that, that's just a straight line through f of zero. Now, from there, we can add the derivative of f. We can add plus f prime of zero times x. Now, if you look here, our x is currently zero, so this whole term cancels out. Meaning that if we were to approximate the value of zero, we, that would give us f of zero plus zero, which checks out, right? But if we wanted to approximate a value further away from zero, then this is pretty much the formula for local linear approximation. The approximation equals the value of a function at the point plus the f prime of zero change in y over change in x times x. That's the formula for local linear approximation that we saw before. 
Okay, and I would take the tangent line and approximate the value like that. Now we can go further. We can add the second derivative of our function at zero times x squared over two, okay? Now you might be asking yourself, why did I write x squared over two this time? Well, that's just to make sure that our approximation still lines up at x equals zero. So let me show you what I mean by that. If we were to take an approximation if we were to use our approximation function to approximate the value of the graph at x equals 0, we plug in x equals 0, that equals f of 0, plus the x term 0, x squared term 0, plus 0, plus 0. So this checks out. Okay. If we wanted to double check a prime of 0, then we would differentiate the right side of the equation, which would give us f prime of 0. This, this is a constant. It gets crossed out. This gets differentiated, so we just eliminate the x term. And this 2 gets differentiated to give us f double prime of x. f double prime of 0 times x. This over 2 term is meant so that when we do the power rule with x squared, the 2's cancel out and we're just left with an x term. Okay? So, a prime of 0, we plug in the 0 for our x value, that becomes f prime of 0 plus 0. That checks out. a prime of 0 equals f prime of 0. So our goal here is to get our approximation function equal to the actual function at all derivatives. Okay? So we keep going further. We keep adding terms, plus f triple prime of 0 times x to the third over 6, or 3 times 2, okay? Such that the general formula for our approximation function is such that it equals the infinite sum from n equals 0 to infinity of f, the nth derivative of f at x equals 0 times x to the n over n factorial. Okay? So let's see what that shows us. Let's expand this out a bit. You know, we plug in our 0 for n, that gives us the 0th derivative of f of 0, or f of 0 itself, times x to the 0 is 1, uh, 1 factorial is 1, so that just times 1, which cancels out, which gives us our original term up there. In the next iteration, we add the first derivative, n equals 1, of f at 0, times uh, x to the 1 is x, over 1 factorial is 1. See, everything checks out. Second time, f double prime of 0, times x squared, n equals 2, over 2 factorial, which is 2. And you can see how the function expands outward such that the infinite sum of all these terms actually converges to our original function f of x, which is very powerful. Now, I said before that the Maclaurin series was a special type of Taylor series. What I just showed for you right here was the Maclaurin series. The Maclaurin series is a series such that it is centered at x equals zero. Instead of being centered at x equals 0, we could have been centered at x equals 3. In that case, our approximation function would be the infinite sum n equals 0 to infinity of f of n of the nth derivative of 3 times 
x minus 3 to the n over n factorial, okay? Now let me show you how this works. If we were to try and expand out our approximation function here, n equals 0, that's f of 3, plus n equals 1, that's f prime of 3, times x minus 3, n equals 2 f double prime of 3 times x minus 3 squared over 2, okay? So this is our approximation function, you know, plus dot dot dot, centered around x equals 3, okay? And if we plug in, let's approximate the value of 3. All of the terms with this when x equals 3, that term goes to 0, that term goes to 0, so all these terms cancel out, they go to 0, and we're left with a of 3 equals f of 3. That checks out. Okay? You can see how this iterates uh, down through a prime of 3. We differentiate the right side of the function. This is a constant. is deleted. Oh no, excuse me. One too far to the right. This is a constant. It gets deleted. Okay, and x minus 3, that's, we can do, um, what was the name of it, chain rule on that, and we'll see that this just gets, the x term is removed when we differentiate it, so we're left with a prime of 3 equals f prime of 3, and if we look here, when we try to plug in 3 into this, the whole thing goes to 0, and everything further to the right goes to zero. A prime of three equals F prime of three. So that checks out, okay? So, obviously for practical reasons, you will often never be able to calculate an infinite number of derivatives for a function, okay? So in the special cases that that is possible, like e to the x, where you know, e to the x is the derivative of e to the x, and so on and so forth. When the situations come along where that is not possible, you will likely only have a finite amount of derivatives, okay? So, if your function like, will look like this, and uh, your approximation was centered right here at x equals 3, then uh, if you only had maybe n equals 3 derivatives, your function might you know, deviate a bit like that. If you had only maybe n equals 3 derivatives, your graph might look like this. Still a really good approximation, especially when the uh, item you're approximating is close to x equals 3. It's a lot better than tangent line approximation but you'll see it still doesn't converge to the actual value of our function. Okay, so if we're only given a finite number of derivatives, how do we go about finding the error between our approximation and our actual function? Well, um, this next topic is called Lagrange error bound. It's what I was referencing earlier when I talked about there are two types of error bounds in the series unit. Lagrange error bound. In my opinion, Lagrange error bound is my favorite part of series, but a lot of kids tend to stress out over it just because you need to memorize this really lengthy and complex uh, equation slash item that you need in your FRQ response to get points for showing your work. But once you memorize that, it's really simple from that point on. It's just basic series. Okay, so I'm going to show you the really complex equation, and then I'm going to go into a lot more depth as to actually what it means. Don't get freaked out now. You're not supposed to know what it means just yet. Okay? So, our remainder function, or our approximation function, uh, our approximation function of an nth degree uh, polynomial of x, absolute value, is less than or equal to the absolute value of m 
multiplied by x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial such that the absolute value of the n plus 1 derivative of f of x is bounded beneath or equal to the value m on the interval x a closed interval f a. So that's a lot of math right there. So let's get into exactly what this means, okay? So for demonstration purposes, I'm going to uh, use f of x equals e to the x because that's easy to visualize what the uh, like super high order derivative looks like. It looks like e to the x, okay? So if I gave you a graph, if I gave you a graph of e to the x, we all know what e to the x looks like. It looks a little something like that, okay? Now let's start with this term right here. The absolute value of your n plus 1 the derivative of x is less than or equal to m. What that's effectively trying to tell us is that m represents an upper bound on the value of our function. Okay, these absolute value bars are important because they just represent how far our function is from zero. We don't care if this is negative e to the x because that still remains the same distance from zero. And the m just runs to represent how far off is it. Okay, it's a bound. Now, if we look at e to the x, or if we look at the n plus 1 the derivative of e to the x, it's the, still the same function, but you may know, you may see that the e to the x grows unbounded, grows to infinity. So how exactly do we figure out our m? How exactly do we find an upper bound for this function? Well, that's the neat thing about this theorem. It says on the interval x comma a. You don't need to find an upper bound for the function at all points. You need to find an upper bound for the function on this closed interval. So if you remember extreme value theorem back when we did graphical analysis, unit 5, extreme values theorem stated that the function must incur a absolute maximum value on any closed interval. Let's just say that our a is 0 and our x is 1. Okay, if you're confused as to which variable represents what, I want you to refer back to our Maclaurin series, uh, Taylor series approximation. a represents what you are centered at. So in this case, a would be 3 and x would remain as x, or in our Maclaurin example, a would be 0, because it's just x, so in this case this is uh, an error bound of a Maclaurin series. The Lagrange error bound represents the error between a function and its Taylor or Maclaurin series approximation. a is 0 means our approximation is centered at 0 here, and x equals 1 means we're approximating x equals 1 the value of e to the x, where x equals 1. So, on the interval, this should say ax, excuse me. So, on that interval, since we know what our n plus 1 derivative is, we can actually plug into it. So, in this case, we would plug in a equals 0, e to the 0 equals 1, and x equals 1, e to the 1 equals e, Therefore, our maximum value that our function is bounded by is e, okay? So, we can rewrite this part as the n plus 1 derivative of x is less than or equal to e equals m. That's going to represent our m, okay? Now, in other cases, uh, there are three basic types of cases that you have 
when you're evaluating this part of the uh, error bound, okay? So case number one is you know what the function is going to be, which we just went over. Case number two is you don't know what the function is going to be, but you can use general reasoning to figure out where it's bounded. Perfect example is you know, f of x equals sine x, okay? We know that the derivatives of sine x constantly oscillate between sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine. Okay, and we know that those two functions, sine and cosine, and their negations will always have a maximum value of one or a minimum or a maximum absolute value of one because they go from one to negative one. So we can look at that and know that we don't know what the derivative is, but we know it will have a maximum bounded value of one. The third case is. You don't know what the n plus 1 to the derivative of f of x is, but they give you a sort of, how to put this, equation to give you what the n plus 1 to the derivative of f of x is. It might look like um, n to the n plus 1 over 5n times n to the 5, or something like that. Okay, they're going to give you some value, some equation, and they're going to say that equals the n plus 1 to the derivative of f of x. Okay, and the moment you see that, you just say, okay, since this equals f of x, that means if uh, our value m is uh, either greater than or equal to that, we could just say, okay, Let's choose the smallest possible m. The smallest possible m is the m that is not greater than this, but is equal to this. So, once we set m equal to this, we just substitute that value in for m, and after you go through this whole process, after you find what your upper bound is, after you figure out and determine what m is, you go and substitute that into the other half of our equation here. So once you determine m, that's sort of the one part of this problem that is constant across all ways this problem could be asked. Now going forward from here, the way you deal with this equation sort of depends on the type of problem you're asked. So let me get some practice problems for us. Okay, so our problem states Estimating sine of negative 0 0.1, sine of negative 0 0.1, such that x equals negative 0 0.1, and our function f of x equals sine x. Estimating sine of negative 0 0.1 using a Maclaurin polynomial. Maclaurin polynomial states that we're centered at 0, therefore our a equals 0. What is the least degree of the polynomial? Least degree means least number of terms, least number of derivatives, least number of n's. So we're trying to minimize n, what is the least number of n's? That assures an error smaller than 0 0.01. So ensure our remainder of our nth degree polynomial is less than 0 0.001. Okay, so that's, let me say that again. Estimating sine of negative 0 0.1 using a Maclaurin polynomial, what is the least degree of the polynomial that assures an error smaller than 0 0.001? Okay, we're looking for what is the least n, what is the least number of terms that our Taylor series, or in this case Maclaurin series, needs to have in order to ensure an error smaller than this. So, like I just went over, we have f of x equals sine x. We know that that will fundamentally be bounded underneath uh, 1. That's going to be our m, that's going to be our maximum value, our upper bound. So we're going to substitute that in right here to our equation where m is supposed to be. And we're given that our remainder, or our error, must be less than this value.
the absolute value of the remainder function is less than or equal to m times x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, such that the n plus 1 for derivative of f of x is bounded underneath m on the interval, the closed interval a to x, or x to a. Use your common judgment to figure out which one's smaller, which one's bigger. You need to write this whole thing on your FRQ before you begin your FRQ. You understand me? You need to write this whole thing down. Memorize it. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna rewrite this over here. Uh, we've got R sub N of negative 0 0.1 the absolute value must be less than or equal to our m, we already decided is 1, so we can leave that out. a is 0, and our x is just negative 0 0.1, negative 0 0.1 to the n plus 1, over n plus 1 factorial. Well, that must be less than 0 0.001. Okay? So this term is no longer useful to us. We're just looking at this, which contains our n's, and our 0 0.001. So, on all the Lagrange error bound problems, whether they be multiple choice or FRQ, it will always give you a calculator for them, okay? So what you do here is you just go into y equals, you plug this in as a function, you know, ignore this part, just plug this into y equals, you know, replace n with x. So I would plug in, um, bear with me a moment, I'll show you how to plug in factorial to your calculator. Negative 0 0.1 in parentheses raised to the x plus 1 all divided by x plus 1. And for factorial, what you do is when you're in your y equals screen right here. You go to math, which is on the left side of your calculator, and you scroll all the way atop the screen down to prob right here. Prob, then number four, you see the exclamation mark, that's factorial. You hit enter, and there, your factorial is on the denominator of your function that we have right here. So I just hit second table, and now that I have the table, I can look at all the values of my um, error here. And remember, x is, represents 1, represents n, x represents n. And so we look at our table and find when is the first value that our uh, output is less than this. And in this case, the first value is n equals 2. Okay? If you look at the graph, if you're doing this along with me, when x was 1, our uh, error was 0 0.005. And when x equals 2, our error was negative 0 0.0002. One final topic for series is uh, intervals of convergence, or sometimes called radius of convergence. I'll explain the difference between the two. Let me just make a tad bit of room here while I explain. So, functions can often be represented as something called a power series, okay? Now, what that is, is it's a geometric series. I hope you all remember what geometric series are. I covered them in this video. It's a geometric series that represents a function, okay? So, if, um, let's say I gave you a function g of x equals the infinite sum of some constant value a times x to the n. That is a geometric series where our constant ratio is x, okay? Now, as we have determined from our previous tests that I covered previously in the video, we know that g of x will converge if all of the sequential terms in the series are decreasing and the 
as the limit approaches infinity of the infinitith, or the last term of the series, that limit must approach zero. The last term in the series must be zero. So, in this case, we would look at this, and we would say, okay, what do we have to do to make sure this is constantly decreasing and approaches zero? Well, in this case, x would have to be bounded between positive 1 and negative 1. Open interval, okay? Because if x is less than 1, if you apply a decimal value to an exponent, that decimal becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? Let me give you a different example. Let's say we were given the function g of x equals x to the n over n times 5 to the n, okay? Excuse me. g of x equals the infinite sum of x to the n over 5 over n times 5 to the n, okay? And you were asked for an interval of convergence, okay? An interval of convergence is what values of x, what interval of x values does my infinite series need to be bounded between in order to converge, okay? So in our first example here, our interval of convergence was soft parentheses, negative 1, 1, okay? That was our interval of convergence, because it's an interval. A radius of convergence is a number. In this case, our radius of convergence was 1. The radius of convergence means given a central value, in this case the central value is 0, what distance to either side of that value can we deviate and still converge? Exclusive meaning hard pr soft parentheses, exclusive soft parentheses, meaning not including that number, but everything between our central limit and that number. What is the distance around that central number with which we can still converge? Okay, so I think this example does that up pretty nicely. For this one, I want you guys to try this on your own. Pause the video and try this on your own. Remember, we need to ensure that it is decreasing and that it ultimately converges to zero. Okay, so I'm assuming you've uh, taken a crack at it. Let's, uh, let's work through this together. So, what can I do to uh, simplify this, to make the terms cancel? Okay, I see an x to the n here and a 5 to the n here. How about I set x equals to 5. Let me see what happens. When I set x equal to 5, these terms cancel, and I left with 1 over n. 1 over n is constantly decreasing. Limit goes to 0. However, we know 1 over n. 1 over n does not converge. It diverges. Because p needs to be greater than 1. the exponent needs to be greater than 1 in order for it to converge. So, when x equals 5, that doesn't work. What about when x equals 4? Well, in that case, you've got a 4 to the n over a 5 to the n, and that converges a lot faster. So, you can say that in this case, we can, uh, our upper bound of the interval of convergence can go to 5 exclusive, soft bracket, and let me see here, it can go to negative 5 hard bracket. I want you to tell me right now why I'm able to do a hard bracket on the negative 5. So I'm, I hope you've tried and explained it to yourself. Uh, let me rewrite this so it's easier to visualize and explain. 5x to the n over n times 5 to the n. When we plugged in 5, we got 1 over n, which was divergent. But 
In this case, if I do x equals negative 5, that can be broken up into negative 1 times 5 all to the n, and I can distribute the exponent, negative 1 to the n, times 5 to the n, and if I sub that back in for x, we get negative 1 to the n times 5 to the n over n times 5 to the n. These guys cancel, and now I'm left with negative 1 to the n over n, which is an, the alternating harmonic series, which does converge. So that's why I'm able to put a hard bracket here on the negative 5. I'm able to use negative 5. But 5, since it does not give me an alternating series, it leaves me with 1 over n, this does not converge. So in a question like this, they would not ask you for a radius of convergence because uh, the, ra the radius is different on both ends. Okay? They would ask you to just state the interval of convergence. And um, that's pretty much series, everyone. Um, if you guys need any extra help with anything, drop into my Discord server, ask me anything you want to be my guest. I don't charge. Otherwise, thanks so much.